responsibility on pediatric development. And this morning, we have the privilege of having um, speak with us, Caitlin McDonald and Julie Kegney and Sarah Murdoch. And Caitlin is an occupational therapist with the International Center for Spinal Cord Injury at Kennedy Krieger Institute since July of 2010. She works per diem for the Kennedy Krieger Institute's Home and Community Program. Julie is a clinical specialist at the International Center also for Spinal Cord Injury at Kennedy Krieger. She received a bachelor's degree at the, Pencil St at the Pennsylvania State University and has her DPT program for the University of Southern California. Um, she, her research interests are in pediatric assessment and treatment following neurological insult. She is experienced in wheelchair prescription, gait and orthotics and, developing hand, and developmental handling. Sarah has been a physical therapist at, with the International Center for Spinal Cord Injury at Kennedy Krieger Institute also. And she received her Bachelor of Biology and Health Sciences and Doctorate of Physical Therapy from, oh, Dupin, thank you, University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It just, those words didn't flow naturally off my tongue. Her clinical interests include functional electrical stimulation, aquatic therapy, and seating and mobility. She's experienced as a land and aquatic therapist for children and adults with neuromuscular diagnosis. The, la the ladies have asked that we have questions at the end of this session. And um, without further ado, um, I let them share with you their disclosure. And thank you for being here. So good morning, everyone. I'm Julie. Um, and we wanted to say thanks for coming on Saturday. So we have no financial interest or, or nothing to disclose. We started to come up with the idea for this presentation pretty much because we work with children with a variety of diagnoses who have really complex neurologic um, complications. And we do a lot of education when we send these kids from rehab back into their home communities um, with therapists and vendors who may not have as much exposure to children with complex diagnoses. And we were doing a lot of education one-on-one, -on -one, and we thought it would be a really good um, idea to share this information with all of you. So the objectives of this presentation this morning are to recognize the importance of mobility in children who are under the age of three, apply the, a brief current literature review to explain and classify the areas of pediatric development that would benefit from early mobility, most notably cognition, social interaction, visual, perceptual skills, um, social interaction, and uh, the orthopedic benefits. <clears throat> Identify various funding sources in addition to insurance um, to help you acquire this equipment and uh, assess and select the appropriate devices that then you could prescribe to help these children. So we all know that locomotion isn't just walking. And children have many benefits of having self-directed locomotion. These are just a few of the really important benefits to getting children moving as much on their own as possible. Uh, we know that self-directed locomotion is critical in the development of many cognitive and social um, developmental milestones, including depth perception, memory, object permanence, and object relation from oneself to the environment. We also know that experience, not just age and maturation alone, drives perceptual cognitive development. And self-induced movements are critical in the development in a multitude of systems. <clears throat> what we know is that motor development can be rate limiting in all of these factors. So, if a child has the cognitive abilities but is unable to move and experience the world, that can be the primary roadblock to that child developing more appropriately. And if infants are unable to engage in motor activities necessary for the acquisition of perceptual cognitive skills, the motor problem may in fact be their primary limitation. So what's the evidence? And again, this is very brief. There are tons of articles and resources that you can use, but we tended to pick the most appropriate ones. So the resident position paper on the application of power chairs for pediatric users states that age-appropriate supervision is always necessary. If your typically developing two-year-old wants to go play outside, you're not going to send them out to play in the street alone, just like you wouldn't send your two-year-old or your 18-month-old who's in a chair out to play alone. You're always going to have age-appropriate supervision, and we can use attending controls and other devices in order to do that in children who use mobility. We also know that a child's ability to drive a motorized wheelchair is related to their cognitive readiness, not their chronological age. If a child's interested in a toy, if they want to move, that's enough that they may be able to use a device to assist them in moving. 
And functional independent mobility has been shown to reduce learned helplessness and increase confidence in interaction with peers. And I will say that most of the evidence that's available is related to powered mobility, but we can apply a lot of these concepts into other types of mobility also, like manual mobility, standards, and some of the other equipment that Sarah will address later. <clears throat> so some more evidence. And these are just three studies that highlight the appropriate use of mobility in a variety of diagnoses. So the first study looked at children who have orthopedic limitations and cerebral palsy in as young as 18 to 72 months. They looked at a variety, a variety of outcome measures, but all of the outcome measures showed positive interactions. Most of the outcome measures looked at some parental stress. All of the parents after powered mobility training had less stress um, and more, were more comfortable with their children. The child had, that all of the children had better sleep-wake schedules after training in mobility, and there were no negative emotions associated with stress and with wheelchairs after the training, which is really important. How many of you have heard, oh, I don't want my child to use a wheelchair because they won't be interested in walking, or I don't want them to look different. So this study highlights that the parents did not have those emotions regarding their child's use of the power chair. In another study, looking at children with a variety of diagnoses, neurologic and orthopedic, 14 to 30 months, so a little bit younger, they again did power mobility training and looked at a variety of outcome measures, including some motoric and cognitive social um, tests. And again, all of the scores increased significantly more than children who had the same cohort of diagnoses, but did not get powered mobility training. We can say that this may have been due to a lot of different reasons. Perhaps those children had more attention and they were getting more positive reinforcement from their parents and their caregivers, but also that experience to learn and move about is likely what happened to help increase those scores. And in the last study, again, with just a brief review, was in children who have spina bifida, and again, even younger, seven to 12 months with powered mobility training, looking at the Bailey, which Primarily, their outcomes were looking at cognition and language, and all of these children with spina bifida had increases that were faster than other children with their chronological age. So again, that positive experience of moving about and being self-directed really improved a variety of their cognitive and expressive um, abilities. So how do we determine what child is ready? It, this really comes down to clinical judgment. IQ is not an adequate determinant of ability for eligibility. Children who are motivated, who have some sort of capability to move, will find a way to move. And if we can give them those tools, they may be ready. And what we found, especially, is unless you put a child in a device, you don't know what their abilities are. There are lots of access options. There are lots of ways to adapt equipment so that the child can move. But until you put them in that device, we don't know what will work. There are some child-specific outcome measures. The most appropriate one that we found to use is the pediatric power wheelchair screening test. Again, this is for power chairs. Um, looking at the child's ability to have cause and effect, spatial relationship, judgment, motor planning, and reaction time. But again, unless a child's really motivated, I think we all know the kids who you give them a pen and the paper and you want them to color and they won't do it. But somehow, there's crayon marks all over the wall. So unless a child's motivated, we really don't know what they're going to do. And next we'll go to Sarah. So I'm just gonna talk about different um, devices to facilitate mobility, go over some of the um, letters of medical necessity, how to get it justified, and some alternative sources for funding. So we'll start with um, manual wheelchairs. So this is for the patient that has good upper, upper extremity and trunk strength, balance, and endurance. You wanna make sure that it's gonna grow. You wanna make sure that it's gonna last them through some growth spurts. Um, kids are growing rapidly, so you wanna make sure it's gonna last a few years so you can maybe try using growth kits or building depth into the wheelchair to help it grow with them. Um, different components, you want to make sure that they're adjustable. So laterals, you want to make sure as they grow, they can be moved on the chair or they can be moved in. Headrests, um, other positioning devices, all of those are able to be adjusted as they grow with the chair. You want to make sure that they have access to the rear, rear wheels and also that their center of gravity is appropriate in the chairs. And also, not to mention the um, seat to floor height, you want to make sure that's able to be changed as they grow too. 
Um, these kids might be in this chair for a long time, so you wanna make sure that you're preserving their shoulders and decreasing their risk of overuse injury. So keeping the weight down, um, keeping the rolling resistance reduced is really key for these kiddos. And also giving the caregivers access. So there's gonna be a time, especially long distances or keeping up with their peers, they might need a little bit of assistance from their, from their parents. So the push handles might be a lot higher on these chairs and look more stroller-like than um, adult chairs. So the next is um, power wheelchairs. Same things apply for power wheelchairs. You're gonna wanna make sure that they grow with the child, they're adjustable. Um, these might be more for progressive diagnoses, higher level injuries, um, kiddos with poor trunk control and endurance. You wanna make sure that they can get access to the floor, just like Julie mentioned, the developmental benefits. Um, it's age appropriate for them to be playing on the floor, so you wanna make sure that they can get to the floor. Um, you also wanna make sure that there's an attendant control for the parents so that they can help if needed. A typical toddler might need to be pulled out of a situation quickly if their safety is in danger. So the same thing applies to a power wheelchair. There might be a way that you might need to take the power wheelchair into the um, parent's hands for a minute um, just to make sure that the child is safe and then give them back their control afterwards. Um, also, the different types of control, their abilities might change as they get older. So you wanna think about the head arrays, the sip and puffs, the chin controls, and different types of joysticks to use. Um, they might change as they get older, so you wanna account for that as well. So before we talk about mobile standards, some of the benefits of standing we'll talk about first. Uh, children with impaired mobility are at an increased risk of developing musculoskeletal abnormalities such as scoliosis and pelvic misalignment. So there's a variety of medical benefits listed here, and I just wanted to briefly mention just the prevention of contractures, reduction in spasticity, which we see with a lot of our kiddos in the spinal cord injury population, um, prevention of osteoporosis, and development and improvement of upper body and core strength. And then there's also the psychological benefits. So they can be, they're able to interact with their environment in an age appropriate way. They're eye level with their peers. They're having a better sense of like normalcy with their um, age matched peers. And then these can be used at daycare, schools, community, and in the home. So they're pretty transportable and they can get around and move around on their own. So some of the key concerns are this, similar to the wheelchairs. You wanna make sure they're gonna be able to grow with the patient. You're not gonna put them at the highest end of the growth of the, of the abil available growth of the standard. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that it can grow with them as they get older. Um, you're also gonna make sure the components are good for a neutral posture. So they might need more support at their trunk. They might need some foot positioning. Um, the height of the chest plate might help with their trunk control and you wanna make sure that they have appropriate access to the wheels and the mobile standards. So these will probably be used for patients with good upper extremity strength, good head control is really important, and appropriate trunk control. Some of that can be um, determined with the positioning devices. And then the most important thing is that they're in these to explore their environment, so all the benefits of being able to explore that Julie had talked about before, that's the most important part of the standards. And then there's all kinds of other equipment. So we're just gonna touch on a few things, but there's tons of options out there. So this is just a few. So you wanna be able to use the skills that the child has to explore the environment. So if they have really great upper extremity strength, you might consider using the star car, or if they're having problems with hip flexion range of motion, you might get them in a prone scooter so that they can play on the floor, on their bellies, get that hip flexion stretch, but still getting able, being able to move around their environment. And you wanna make sure, if they have um, lower extremity strength, you might be using walkers, or if they need more support, maybe the gait trainers with different positioning devices. And also the tricycles are really important for these kids because all their other peers are using tricycles too, so it gives them that sense of normalcy and they're still working on their abilities. You wanna make sure that all of these devices are adapted to fit their abilities and give them their independence to explore their environment. So next we'll talk briefly on the ride-on toy cars. Um, these are great because they're an alternate option for, for the patients. They can keep up with their peers. Um, you can build them custom to the patient. So if they're working on standing, you might use a sit-to-stand car. Um, if they only have head control, maybe you use a switch just so that they can use their head to activate the switch and move the car. 
Um, everything's very customized. The support can be customized. And the best part is that you can find a lot of the pieces to customize these chairs in hardware stores and toy stores, so they're a little less expensive. They're pretty easy to transport for the, for the parents, and the parents are even able to build these to toy cars on their own at home with, with the recommendations of their therapist for the support. So this video I'm gonna show here. It's an 11 month old, he um, had poor trunk control. Um, his parents were really frustrated because he was always in the stroller and he wasn't able to get around and they could see the frustration on him. So we wanted to be able to give him his mobility back when he was with us. The first trial, which isn't in this video, but the first trial he just got in the car, flopped over and put his head on the switch. And once he realized the switch made the car move, his head came right up, he put his hand on the switch um, and he started to move and he was so happy. He um, even cried when we got him out of this car, so. So this car isn't customized to him, so we had to kind of figure out a way to keep his trunk supported, but he just loved it. <laughs> So next we'll talk about how to justify these things. Um, first we'll talk more about the wheelchairs and then kind of briefly touch on standards and other devices. So it's important to remember, it's appropriate for children at this age to require supervision with mobility. So when you're writing your letters and things like that, you wanna make sure it's clear that even their typically developing um, aged peers are gonna require supervision, might require um, assistance for these things. So it's important to remember those. It's also important um, for development, so mentioning some of the developmental benefits is important to do. You wanna mention their current positioning in their shoulder or other devices and how that could be harming their positioning for the future. Um, you wanna use outcome measures as appropriate and pictures and videos um, never hurt, so using those um, when they're in the device would be great. We also, when we're sending our letter, letters of medical necessity, submit articles to help justify as well. So these are just some um, screenshots of our generic element and we kind of customize it based on um, the patient. So first one, the first category you wanna look at is their current system. You wanna write how it promotes dependence. Um, it's poor positioning, it might lead to costly postural abnormalities in the future. They're not able to explore their environment age appropriately. All those things would be good to mention when you're trying to justify why they need this other piece of device that's really gonna help those things. And their ADLs and mobility and balance, you want, this is where you really wanna highlight that supervision is appropriate for these kids. Typically developing children require assistance and supervision for these things too. So that's where you really wanna describe, yes, they might need supervision, but so do their typically developing age match peers too. So this is just a slide with some objective measures and you'll add in the ones that you're using. Um, you wanna use um, the ones that are most appropriate for the child and modify it to them and take out ones that you're not using. Um, the push test, I don't think any child is gonna push for six minutes, so um, even modifying that to maybe two minutes, if you can get them to push for um, two minutes and then showing their progression as they um, have continued trialing those things. And then just some additional objective measures you can use. You can use the GMFM, the seated postural control measure. You can do pressure mapping if they're having a history of wounds or their sensation is poor. You can use the powered mobility program that um, takes into account basic exploratory skills, starting, stopping, direction changing, and speed, as well as functional mobility skills, such as going through doors, hallways, sidewalks, ramps, and different environments. And then Julie had mentioned earlier the pediatric power wheelchair screening test. You can also use that. So some of the other equipment, how to justify it. You wanna make sure you're talking about how it's medically necessary necessary for the patient. You also wanna mention the developmental benefits that Julie talked about briefly before. You wanna mention that the, to the changes in their tone, spasticity, posture, range of motion, strength, and anything else with the use of the device and how it's helping them, and how it's gonna help them in the future as well. Um, you can use outcome measures as appropriate, so the GMFM, the Peabody, the different walk tests for gait, um, and balance tests as appropriate. 
So what do we do when insurance says, no, you can't have this? <laughs> so we really try hard to get our patients the things that they need. So there's other alternative funding sources that you can take a look at. So local service clubs, there might be community VFWs and other community services in that patient's area that might be willing to either pay for a piece of equipment or give money towards a piece of equipment. So some of those things you can look into would be great. Also, a lot of our patients do fundraisers and prioritize what piece of equipment that is most important for their mobility or what's most important for them at that time, and they use that money towards that piece of equipment. Um, some of the other ones we found successful are these four listed below in their websites, um, just different for foundations and organizations, and they all have different requirements, different paperwork that you want to fill out for them, but we've had some success with these in the past. There's a ton of resources out there, so at the end, we'd love, if you guys have any other resources, we'd love to open it up to the floor and share with everyone so everyone can benefit from more of them. And then lastly, you just wanna make sure that the equipment is appropriate for the child and their abilities. You wanna give them that mobility, to, the ability to explore their environment and um, continue their development in an age-appropriate way. You wanna give them that sense of normalcy that they can keep up with their peers and um, get to play with them just like they would um, if they were a typically developing child. And also not everyone who is incapable of walking or propelling a manual wheelchair effectively is a candidate for power mobility. Motivation, understanding of basic cause and effect, spatial relationships, problem solving concepts, um, attention and motor activation for drive controls are necessary. So I'm gonna hand this over to Caitlin and we're gonna go over some case studies and the equipment we used for them. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us on Saturday morning at the end here. Um, so we're just going to go through three case studies um, just to kind of talk through some of uh, what we have done at Kennedy for these kids. Um, and the first one we're going to go through is Wyatt. So he came to us at 11 months of age. He was injured at eight months of age with transverse myelitis. Um, he had cervical, uh, cervical level injury based on MRI and his physical findings. He initially didn't have any control of his motor skills below his shoulders. When he got to us, um, he had right upper extremity weakness still and fine motor deficits bilaterally, but his arms at the shoulder, elbow, and wrist had kind of fully recovered by that point. He did appear to have decreased or absent sensation in his lower extremities and also in his trunk, and he appeared to have full lower extremity paralysis. Um, he was also dependent for every position that they were putting him in at that point, functional mobility, rolling, everything. Um, so he was able to sit for short periods of time, about one minute at a time with his arms supported on the mat table or wherever they had him in bed. Um, so he came to us and he stayed with us for four weeks and he was inpatient and he got intensive ABRT, which is activity-based therapy. Um, so that basically, just briefly to summarize it, is a team approach where we really try to focus on independence with functional activities throughout the day and just encourage movement and independence. Um, so at the end of the four weeks, he had some hip flexor extensor activation, but it was pretty inconsistent. Um, he was beginning to weight bear through his lower extremities and supported standing devices and also occasionally would kick in a little bit of lower extremity activation, but it, again, was very inconsistent. He was starting to commando crawl, crawl short distances. Um, he did have improved trunk strength. He was able to sit and he was able to lift one arm at a time, which is great because that's how he's going to start to interact and play like a typical 11-month-old would. Um, he required less caregiver assistance. They could step away for a little bit when he was sitting if he was in a safe, supported area. Um, he was also starting to roll and do some of his bed mobility, and his upper extremity strength and fine motor skills um, were now within the average range on the Peabody. So he had made good improvements while he was with us. Um, so we trialed a lot of different mobility devices with him, and again, we were encouraging him to commando crawl because he was independent with that for very short distances. We educated the family on how to do assisted quadruped crawling with him, so they were able to assist him with that, um, and they were very interested in doing that at home, which is why we thought it was appropriate for them. 
Um, he trialed a mobile stander and a manual wheelchair. The family at that time was not interested in a power wheelchair. We did educate them on the benefits of powered mobility, um, but they just weren't interested in that at this time. Um, and he was also doing locomotive training and overground gate training and was using gate trainers. Um, and he came to us in an ad adapted stroller. So that's kind of what they had prior to his admission with us. Um, so this Good first job, video here it. is him. Come on. The first time I got him in the manual wheelchair. Good job. Keep going. Keep going. Good job, bud. You're almost here. Come get the toy. Yeah, keep going. You're almost here. Keep going. A little closer. Ah. <laughs> so you can see for an 11 month old we would think that was appropriate they would crawl or do whatever they could to get to a toy maybe about 10 to 25 feet away and that's exactly what he was doing in the manual chair as soon as we got him in it he would push a few feet go try to get a toy he wasn't going to push himself just to go anywhere because that's a typical 11 month old so we did re we were able to recommend a manual wheelchair for him Again, he required age-appropriate supervision. This wasn't going to be something they were going to just leave him in um, and not be watching him. Um, and then he came back to us about six months later in his custom manual wheelchair. Again, this first video was kind of what we had available and to trial, so it didn't fit him exactly what, right. Um, but then this is him six months later, so he was about 18 months at this point. Oops. <laughs> Hold on. There we go. Okay, Wyatt, are we going to the playroom? Yeah. Okay. Oh my God. Keep going. Are we going to the playroom? Yes. So you can say he can maneuver through doorways now. He's remembering Where, familiar how do we get spaces. There? <laughs> he doesn't want his photo taken. Don't take a picture. Okay. Let's go to the playroom. No picture? Okay. Playroom. Come this way. Ready? Let's go on the elevator. So you can see he was propelling much longer distances at this point. Again, age appropriate distances probably for what a kid at 18 months is going to do, depending on where they're at with development. Um, he was able to keep up with his peers. He was in a daycare program and his mom said he was out there with the rest of the daycare kids, just moving around, doing what he wanted to do. Um, he was, he always did require distance supervision, but again, at that age, we would expect that for those kids. Um, and his cognitive devel development had kind of flourished in those six months, which again is age appropriate, um, but you know, I'm glad that he was in something that he was able to continue to develop that. Um, so the next, does anyone have any questions on Wyatt before we go to the next case study? No? Okay. So our next case study is Owen. So he came to us at three years of age. He was injured um, a year before when he was two in a car accident. He was a, around a C2 spinal cord injury, so he had movement. He was able to shrug his shoulders, but that was all he could do. He had very limited head control. Um, he was when he he was not really able to do much of anything. He came to us in an adapted stroller, um, but was dependent for everything. He was also on a diaphragmatic pacer or a ventilator, which he was always needing, and he was fed through a G tube. Um, he had a VP shunt. He also, at the time of injury, had a GCS of seven, so he did have a history of brain injury. When he got to us, he was, he was still showing mild brain injury, um, was presenting with that still. Um, so like I said, he was dependent for everything, and he had no sensation below his neck. So after four weeks of the inpatient ABRT, he was able to sit in a posterior prop position, but needed occasional assistance for head control in that position. When he did have his trunk fully supported, he was able to start holding his head up and controlling it a little bit better. Um, 
we worked a lot on sip and puff. We worked a lot on head control because those were ways that we thought he might be able to get around. Um, so we did trial sip and puff and head control and then also chin control as well. And he um, fatigued very, very quickly with sip and puff and had a lot of trouble with it because the diaphragmatic pacer would pace him at specific times and he was having trouble when he wasn't getting the breath controlling it. Um, and then the head array he was able to use for a very short amount of time and then his neck muscles would fatigue and it wasn't something he could use consistently. Um, so we worked on those things a lot in the chair but also out of the chair during therapy tasks as well. Um, he also promoted, um, was participating in locomotor training and a supported standing program as well while he was with us. So um, we don't have any videos of him trialing the chair with us. However, we have some of where he's at now. So just to give you kind of a background, we did end up going with chin control. Um, we were able to trial, luckily, all three types of controls while he was inpatient, um, and his parents were very involved in that, and he was very involved as much as a three-year-old wants to be. Um, but ultimately, he was too frustrated with the other two types to use them, and so they ended up going with chin control. Now, he did have an adapted stroller that they had gotten a year prior, so we weren't able, insurance wouldn't pay for the power wheelchair because they had just paid for this adapted, really, really nice adapted, um, oh, sorry, it was a, an adapted Tilton Space chair that they had gotten him. So, but he was dependent in that and he couldn't get around independently. So the family went through some different options um, and ultimately the Daryl Gwynn Foundation ended up providing them with a power chair, which was awesome. So let me try to get to these videos here. Okay, so this first one is one that his dad um, let us use. This is him in his home environment um, trying to open the pantry door, just being a typical three-year-old, <laughs> but showing off his skills here. So just showing that he can open and close that door on his own now with the, his power chair. Um, he was very proud of himself for accomplishing this. Um, this video here is one that his dad took of him playing with some kids, um, playing kickball and hockey at school, or daycare, I guess. Good job. <laughs> And then this last one is him being a typical defiant, I think in this video, probably four-year-old now. So his dad wanted him to get into the van. You can see he had other ideas. Come on, dude, let's load up. <laughs> so not wanting to get in the van, just doing what we would want a typical three or four year old Come on, to do. we gotta load up. <laughs> so we'll go back here now. Okay. <laughs> so um, again, the Daryl Gwynn Foundation was able to provide them that wheelchair. Um, they've been a great organization we found for a lot of our kids um, who need, especially the pretty expensive power chairs who might not have been appropriate for powered mobility initially and now are able to. Um, so really good foundation that I would check out. Um, so does anyone have any questions on Owen oh, before we go to the last case study? No? Okay. Too early, right? <laughs> so this last one is Ella. So she um, came to us at two and a half years of age. She got transverse myelitis at nine months of age. She was initially ventilator dependent and had tetraplegia. Again, she wasn't able to move initially anything from shoulders or below. Um, she was also G-tube dependent for feeding, um, and she had impaired sensation and very significant spasticity, especially in her lower extremities. Um, so she 
initially came to us with complete lower extremity paralysis. Her right arm was a little stronger than the left. She did have some anti-gravity or against gravity movements in that right shoulder and elbow and wrist. Her left arm was mostly all gravity eliminated movements, so not really, she wasn't very functional with that left arm when I first saw her. Um, and she had no movements in her hands. So she was able to sit with her arms supported, but still required about moderate assistance at her trunk. So really wasn't sitting up on her own at all. So she participated in six weeks of inpatient ABRT, um, and she was able to sit at the end with upper extremity support and supervision. So she had improved her, at least her arm strength enough to help her sit. Um, she did have upper extremity against gravity movements now bilaterally in her shoulder, elbow, and forearm. So we had, her arms were a little bit more functional bilaterally. Um, and then she had trace left digit movements in that left hand. Um, and some gravity eliminated wrist movements in, on the right. So just to give you a little background, we did try her in power mobility that first time around when she was two and a half months. And I'll show you a video of that, but she just wasn't understanding it. She wasn't understanding the cause and effect. We had put her in it and she was totally, basically dependent for putting her hand on and off. She just wasn't really understanding it after multiple trials over those six weeks. Um, so she returned to us eight months later, and when she had left initially, the family was given a pretty extensive home program. They were very interested in doing this at home, had a lot of family support. She had a one-on-one -on -one caregiver in the home. Not typical for most of our kids, but they were really able to follow through with a lot of the home program recommendations for her. Um, and the family ultimately also decided at the end of that first admission that they weren't comfortable with her getting a power chair at that time either. Um, so what we did was we waited until she returned. Um, so she returned to us and she had gotten decannulated right before she got to us. Um, she looked great. The family had done a really good job of carrying over, the, um, having her in the stander, which we did get her a mobile stander for the home, which she could push, but not really functionally around the house. She needed a little bit of assistance for that, but she was able to kind of initiate the movements. Um, she was also doing assisted quadruped crawling with two people assisting. So again, not typical that a family's going to be able to carry that over in the home, but this family was. Um, they had new goals for her this go around. They wanted her to start assisting with her ADL. She was now three, and they also wanted her to become more independent with being in bed. They wanted her to be able to roll over and do things on her own that she wasn't doing. Um, and also just to improve her sitting balance. She came to us at the second admission. She was able to sit still but needed both hands down, so she couldn't participate in much in that position. So they wanted her to try to be able to lift an arm up and do things like that. Um, so she participated again in, I think, a six-week program because she was getting help with feeding as well. Um, but upon discharge physically, we started to see pretty consistent gluteal activation. So she was still kind of getting a little bit of recovery. She was starting to roll when she was wanting to. Um, she would roll independently. So if there's a toy there she really wanted, she could go get it. Um, she was assisting with her ADLs, but still needed help with everything. And we were able to recommend a power chair. She was a totally different person when we put her in this power chair this time around. Um, so again, we trialed power wheelchairs with various joystick adaptations for her because of her hand strength. We also um, did try her in a manual wheelchair. It just, she didn't have the arm strength to be able to propel it independently though, so the family asked to kind of just discontinue that trial and continue with the power chair, which we were in agreement with. Um, she was using the mobile stander and had that at home. She was doing locomotor training. She was doing dependent um, quadruped crawling and she was starting to reach in prone and do activities like that too, so she could be on the floor with her peers kind of safely and prone doing things. But again, not ideal for a now three-year-old to be doing um, things like that. So here we have some videos of her. This first one is her at the first admission when we trialed power wheelchair mobility. Um, this video was taken at the end of the admission, so we had done multiple trials of power chair mobility with her, and this is kind of where she ended up at the end of this admission. So she was able to push. Can you stop it? Gotta stop. Stop. But just wasn't understanding <laughs> that she needed to stop. She, she would run into anything that kind of came in her way and oh. <laughs> wasn't consistent with turning or going straight or going backwards. Okay. Now you're going to drive some more? Yeah. Whoa, you're going backwards. 
What are you gonna run into? You don't even see us. Hey, Ella, when we say stop, you have to lift your hand up. Yep. Good oh, good girl. Oh, stop. Come on. You can do it. Get out of the way, Oliver. Go to mom. Turn to mom. Can you turn over here? Oh, good girl. Oh, backwards again. Oh, no. Are you going away from mom? You gotta come to mommy. So you kind of get the idea there. She just wasn't able to understand how to go to the correct here? direction. Um, you know, occasionally she would get it, but it was just very inconsistent and kind of rare that she was. So she physically was, we found something that she could do, but just cognitively she wasn't there. And remember, she was injured at nine months of age and had pretty much been dependent up until two and a half years of age. So her cognitive level, um, they were wondering if she actually had some sort of um, brain injury associated with with her injury, um, but the MRI findings didn't show anything significant. Um, so that's kind of where she was at then. So then when she came back to us eight months later, we this was the first time I got her in the power chair. Oops, keep doing that. Who are you going to see? Oh, well, you better go see her then. And you can just hear her voice in the video too. She just isn't exactly at an age appropriate level cognitively. Ooh, good job maneuvering through there. <laughs> so she was able to kind of get through tight spaces. She was able to maneuver the chair. She was going forward and backwards and right and left appropriately. If she wanted to be defiant and go somewhere else, she would, but it was, she was able to stop now um, without someone being right there to lift her hand. Again, still required that age-appropriate supervision, though, in the chair. I would not have left her alone in the power chair um, without someone in the room with her. But we, so we were able to recommend the power chair after this admission. Um, and she had an adapted stroller that her insurance had paid for. Um, and so they were reluctant to pay for a power chair because they had already paid for this stroller, um, I guess, probably went two or three years before, and so we went through the Daryl Gwena Foundation again, and they again provided this great power chair for her and the family, and they didn't have to go through insurance at all for it. Well, we tried, but they wouldn't do it, so <laughs> the Daryl Gwena Foundation covered everything. Um, so she got this great power chair with an Olaf joy control, joystick control, <laughs> and this, these are some current videos that her mom sent me now, so she has probably had the chair for about three months now. Um, so I will show you what she's doing now. So she's out there playing with her sisters in the street. They're on their trikes and she's in her power chair keeping up with them. <laughs> and I was amazed by that video, just her level of alertness and her interaction with her sisters while she was able to drive is a definite change from three months ago, which was the last time I saw her. So um, again, there could be a number of factors as to why that is, but I like to think that having that power chair and independence and that definitely helped with, th with that. And then this is just a quick video showing how she's doing with like curb cutouts and getting around um, in her home environment or community environment, I guess. So there she goes down the street. <laughs> Um, so that is Ella for you. So does anyone have any questions on any of the case studies? No? All right, well we might get out, out of here a little early then. <laughs> so to summarize, we just wanna say that this is a quick overview of kind of what has worked for us. We know there is a lot more out there, um, but we just wanted to let kind of spread the word about what we know has worked for us. And uh, 
but I would also say continue to look and see what there is just this weekend. I think we've seen so many more options and other things that we want to try, so keep looking and keep doing your research to try to find something that works for every kid out there. Um, a thriving child does require a team approach, and you need to work with your vendors and you need to work with the companies to kind of figure out what works for these kids and put them in something and try it, because that's really the only way you're going to figure out if it does work or not. Um, and most importantly, get those kids moving early. So I wish that we had been able to get Ella into a chair earlier, but you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. doesn't. Um, but we did try to find other ways to kind of get her moving. Now that we know about the, the different types of cars and stuff that we can do, I would probably try one of those with her if we, if we had had access to that earlier. Um, but basically, you just never know until you try. And remember that the client drives the choices, not the insurance company. I know that's really difficult, and that can make a lot of work for us as therapists. But there is ways to get these things covered, especially for kids. Um, you know, I think you can really send things into some of these companies. And when you show them these videos of two and three-year-olds and one-year-olds, you know, they're going to be up to at least try to help you out, even if they can only give a little bit. Um, so we do have our references available. If you guys want them, just uh, give us your emails and I can email it out to you guys. Um, but are there any other questions or comments out there? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very oh. much for a lovely presentation. Oh, I think there's a question. <laughs> I see one hand. Is there a microphone I can't really hear? <laughs> sure. Let me see if I can just. Oh. Thank you for a nice presentation. I think it's great that you look at all kinds of mobility from an early age. I just wanted to ask you, do you consider the driving to learn concept? Because this is more like learning to drive. Um, yeah. And the ALP assessment that Lisbeth Nielsen and Josephine Durkin developed? Uh, yeah, so the way that our facility works is we really take a comprehensive approach. And so we took a little bit more of that for this presentation, specifically looking at um, learning to drive to kind of reach beyond just the therapist and kind of get a variety of disciplines involved. Um, but we definitely use mobility in a way, um, like as you were saying, the drive to learn. So really taking a multitude of approaches to increase development um, and providing a lot of different experiences. Um, also at our facility, we're really lucky. Our kids get three hours of PT a day and one to two hours of OT a day. So we really take a developmental approach from the beginning and use mobility devices as like an adjunct. Okay, and you talked about using the seated postural control measure. Do you apply that for the seating posture when you put them in a, for instance, a powered wheelchair? Yes, for sure. And um, do you want to? So, um, like Julie said, we use a lot of different things, and especially with posture, we're hands-on with them every single day. So we kind of take probably that into consideration the most is our hands-on being able to. Um, see what they look like in a variety of different products um, in, her, in the posture assessment for us. And we also use the outcome measures too, especially when we're trying to justify like why they need a specific piece of equipment, we can use those outcome measures to say to insurance companies or whoever we're justifying it to, um, this is why they need it and this is what they look like. <laughs> okay, so you use the outcome measures more to justify the the product you want and not to align the or provide a proper seating posture for optimizing the mobility? So I think we do a little bit of both. I okay. think we use them to, um, you know, look at their posture and see what would be appropriate for them. And then we also use them after the fact too when we're trying to get that piece of equipment for them to justify it too. So we kind of use it both ways. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? My 
I just wonder, do you have anything that's published that also shows how the outcome measures are helping to achieve the pediatric milestones as well by the application of the techniques you've used? You want to go? <laughs> so we're working on publishing a couple of different things, but as you might be able to tell, we're all pretty, we're all within five years of being clinicians. So this was kind of, we've been doing presentations and we're getting our case studies together, but that's definitely something that we're looking at from our facility. Um, we do see a very large population of children um, and provide almost all of them with some sort of mobility device. So that's kind of our next step. Thank you. And I saw another hand over here. Oh, here we go. Ginny. We'd love to give a plug to our friend Deb Fields and Roz Livingstone for their fantastic systematic review on all the evidence for pediatric power mobility. And I'm sure if you emailed them, you could get a copy from them. Always a, we a wealth of knowledge, this one. OK, <laughs> thank you, Ginny. Yes. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank you for the presentation. And I agree with you regarding to the earliest intervention uh, regarding mobility, what was the youngest kids that you've tried with the manual and then electric wheelchair? Can you repeat that? Regarding time? ages, what was the youngest boy or girl that you tried with the manual and the power mobility? Yeah, I think um, the youngest one we've gotten in that we trialed with was eight, eight months? Eight months old, um, and that was a power wheelchair. Um, I think Wyatt, the case study that we did with the manual wheelchair, he was the youngest one for a manual chair, so he was 11 months at the time that we trialed it. Um, but yeah, we've definitely gotten kids in younger in power chairs, and it's not that I wouldn't try the manual wheelchair, um, but I also think we need to keep in mind that these kids are very young, and their shoulder girdles are still developing, um, so that's something to kind of keep in mind in the back of our heads when we are <laughs> recommending power or manual. It's not to say I wouldn't trial both with them, but kind of just educating the family on the effects that getting in a manual wheelchair that early can have on their shoulders and that sort of thing too. Um, but I would still trial if a kid has the upper extremity strength, both of them, with anyone under the age of one, I would say. That makes sense. Anything else? Okay. I don't see any more hands. Yes, we have one here. Just to expand on what you guys said, um, as far as ages go, the thing that they brought up with the adapted switch cars, we're getting kids as young as six months in them. Um, obviously, we're having to give them a lot of postural support, but even just getting that voluntary, them initiating the movement, um, much like we have kids where I constantly have to say, you can't make it go with your nose. Um, but getting them that idea of I am moving myself rather than you are moving me, um, we get a lot more. I see kids with cortical vision, visual impairments, I mean, immediately start, you know, parents are like, oh my gosh, they've never looked at me like that before, or I didn't know that they could see to their right side, or so there's a lot of different ways that I don't, don't just limit yourself to a manual base or a power base. Um, and I think that's where the adaptive switch cars really come in handy. But anything where they are initiating the movement, I think is the main idea that don't limit yourself by an age at all. Uh, really just get them going because that's where they get that motivation and they don't learn that helplessness in trying to get themselves around. Thank you. Okay, any, any other? Yes. I just have a comment regarding the insurance not funding your uh, clients. Um, did you take it through an appeals process? And as a therapist, did you go sit at a hearing with those clients? Because I've had a lot of, this, of success sitting at those hearings once you've hit that third level of appeal, um, especially that case where it was the adaptive stroller was two to three years p prior. Um, but we really need to make sure that we're we can't let insurance get off the hook, even though there is good funding for children uh, outside of insurance funding. Yeah, and I think it's definitely, you know, you have to try, right? We did try to go through insurance with both of those kids who ended up getting it through the Dale Gwynn Foundation. They both went through the appeals process. We wrote many letters trying to appeal it. 
and the insurance company wasn't budging on it. Um, but you're right, I have had other cases where kids had an adapted stroller and still were able to get a manual or power chair a few years down the road, but it was less than five. Um, so you should always try first and go through the appeals process and really work with the insurance first, because that's obviously the ideal way to go with that, so. The only other issue that we've had with going through the appeals process is that that takes an even more an extended amount of time, so longer time that these kids aren't with their mobility devices. So even while we're starting the appeals process, the family's filling out the applications for the, um, for the additional funding so that we can get things moving. So we definitely fight the appeals process. We go through multiple appeals, but during that downtime, we're having the families work, and we're really lucky to have really great social workers who are help, able to help them fill out that paperwork and kind of get things moving. Um, and again, I'm sure you all have had maybe the primary chair funded, but the additional pieces, and again, the foundations will pick up those additional pieces that may not be covered or may be covered um, at an out-of-pocket expense. Um, a lot of the times that when we've gotten it is that they're not independent. And so that's when we, why we make a big push for what is independence for an 11-month-old. Um, your 11-month-old isn't walking 12 hours a day, a typical 11-month-old. Um, and so we try to really justify, that's why um, I think Sarah had mentioned we send in a lot of articles just on development. A lot of our, and once we send those things in, we've been getting a lot more things funded through insurance by pro over providing information when we submit for requests, um, printing out the articles, printing out the references, sending in packets of information. Um, but usually we find that they're saying they're not independent, so why should we pay for it? If they need a caregiver with them, why shouldn't we just get them the stroller where the caregiver's with them? So again, just providing that information and education. Some of the insurance companies will deny pediatric stuff because they haven't reached a prior level of function, which, right, was, right. well, they weren't ambulatory before, right. and so you want to make them ambulatory, but that's not part of the policy, so. Okay. Do we have anybody else who's got comments or questions? Thank you. I'm getting my work out, it's lovely. Uh -huh. Just to switch gears, um, I actually work with adults who have developmental delays, but a lot of them are starting to drive power for the first time ever. And so one of the things that we've noticed was a lot of them have very limited extremity control, and they also fatigue very easily driving with their head. So one thing that we've had success with is using like a head array, or a, not a head array, but a headrest system with swing away mounts and spec switches so that we can put it very close and then they just have to have very, very limited movement. And then as they get better control, we can move the switch, we attach it with the Velcro or whatever, and then we move the switch wherever, and then they can um, lock it out or whatever. And so they do right, left, forward, backward, you know, and then we have maybe an alternative switch for ma managing their modes and things like that. But um, as far as head arrays, some of those sometimes, and I was thinking about that because of what you said with your little guy. He just couldn't manage it. And some of our folks really getting the cognitive of the chin and something like that would be really difficult for them. But I didn't know if you tried something like that. Yeah, I think um, for him especially, it was, he was three, right? So when we, once he got frustrated with it, there was just no turning back was the issue that I saw a lot with him. Like, we, I think Julie and I both had him and we felt like he could do the head array, but he was, every time we would put him in the chair with the head array adaptation, he would just shut down and not even try for us at, by the end. And so um, the parents really, because he was three, ended up making the decision that they felt like he was really good with the chin control and they were going to go with that option. But I think that's a really good point to like really think about different ways to set up the head array for people who fatigue quickly.